the book to pass around. Have you passed around it already? So could you pass it around so that everybody can take a look? OK, so let's go on. We were just into um, the golden rule for CC NUMA, which says a memory page gets mapped into the local memory of the processor that first touches it. And after, initial, uh, after allocating memory, although you already have an address in your address in your pointer variable, so you think there's some memory there to store things in, it's actually not. You only have a logical address. And the physical mapping, the mapping between the physical pages and the logical pages is done on the first writing to a page. And then if somebody, if, if one thread writes to a page as the first thread to write there, then the complete page gets mapped into this process's local domain if there's enough space left. OK. Now what consequences does this have? Here's a simple code in Fortran. We have two large arrays, A and B. And we initialize A with zeros using this nice um, Fortran array syntax. A equals zero, initializes all the elements with zero. And of course, this is a sequential thing. There's nothing you can do to parallelize this out of the box. Um, later in the code, we have a parallel loop with OpenMP. We use the elements of A to call a function, and we initialize the elements of B. There's no placement problem with B, because this is the first point in the code where we initialize B. So it's automatically initialized in parallel, since it's a parallel loop. But the pages of A will be placed in the local domain of the first thread, probably on the first socket. So this is bad. This is bad newer placement, and we will have non-locality and contention on A in the computation loop. That problem is very easy to fix. You just have to, um, um, you just have to write this assignment as a normal loop, like this: i from one to n, i of i equals zero, and then you can also parallelize this loop. And of course, you should parallelize this initialization loop in the same way that you parallelize the computation loop down the line, so that the access pattern, so which thread gets which element of a, is exactly the same in both cases. Which means each thread that initializes a part of A up here will also read these pages, the same pages again, down in the computation loop. And this is perfect placement. If you can't make sure that the access pattern is the same in both cases, you have a problem. Yeah? We'll come to that. OK, so that's easy to fix. Um, in the latest OpenMP variants, even guaranteed, even if you close the parallel region after the first loop here, and you open up a completely new region later on, it's still guaranteed you have the same mapping of threads to iterations. That was not guaranteed in, in older OpenMP standards, but nowadays you can rely on it. It was always working, so it, it always worked. You could always close the parallel region and open it again, and it's still, you still had the right, the, the proper NUMA placement. The reason why we specify the schedule explicitly here is that the OpenMP standard does not say anything about the default schedule for loops, for word sharing loops. So if you omit it, it could also be dynamic scheduling, yeah, or guided, or whatever. So you don't know. In order to be sure to have a static association of iterations, loop iterations to, uh, to threads, you have to specify the scheduling. Um, this can be very unfortunate in cases where the compiler has a bad default for the scheduling. For example, if you specify schedule runtime, so that you can specify with the OMP schedule runtime variable which actual schedule should be used. And you don't set the variable on runtime. The GNU compiler has a default schedule of dynamic one, which is the worst you can imagine, probably, because this is the highest overhead for any OpenMP loop schedule to get. So always specify it if there is a NUMA placement problem. OK. Now, setting all elements of A to 0 is simple. You can just write it as a loop. But what about this kind of construct? Read 1000A. So for all non fortranists this, uh, this means that we have a unit, number 1000, might be connected to a file. And um, data is read sequentially from this unit, from this file, and put into A. This is, of course, inherently sequential. There's no way we can uh, parallelize this. So here, we cannot parallelize this construct, even if we would like to. 
But it's equally simple to make this work for CC NUMA. All you have to do is still include a loop which initializes the elements of A with any value, doesn't have to be zero. You do this in parallel, and then after this parallel loop, you read the elements of A from the file as usual. Of course, this will be sequential. And then also in this line, read 1000A, we will have some non-local access because the data will be distributed through the machine, but only one thread will read the file. But reading a file is so slow that it doesn't matter. And besides, we're only doing it once. Okay, so this plays no role that we are not using perfect NUMA access here. But the initialization is correct. And later when we use A, everything is fine. So you can fix it also for these cases. Okay, so that was the simple cases. Now, as you can imagine, I've mentioned this, you're pretty much limited to static loop scheduling. You have to make sure that the access, the, the, the mapping between threads and loop iterations is the same for all the loops that are NUMA relevant in your code. If you have a load balancing problem and you are forced to use guided or dynamic scheduling, this is bad because you don't know in the code when which thread will access which iteration at which point in time. And even if you run the code multiple times, this association could change if you have guided or dynamic scheduling. So this is bad, okay? And under such, such situations, you can usually not get perfect NUMA placement unless you play um, advanced tricks, which I will not go into. Um, so we have some, some tips about this. Now there's another problem, um, especially with C codes. For example, if you have global objects, like a huge global array, global static array in C, this will be initialized with zero even before the main function starts. And the code that's, being, that's run before the main function starts is not under your control. So how should you initialize this huge global array? Now there are several solutions to this. You could either make a copy of this array up on, in the main function, work with a copy, which is of course properly placed, and then copy it back at the end if that's necessary. That's one solution. Or you could wrap these global objects into C++ classes. And then if there's a constructor called before the main function calls, you can write the constructor. And you can kick in and do the parallelization um, correctly. Okay? So if you want to use C++, if you can do that. Speaking of C++, arrays of objects, there was a question before the break, um, are a problem. Because if you allocate an array using new, then a constructor is called, a default constructor is called for every array element. And also this object is being placed automatically inside the C++ runtime. So you can't do anything about this. It just happens, okay? It's not a parallel loop. And also if you use std vector, you allocate a vector with many elements. These vectors are by default initialized with a function from the um, STL, uninitialized fill, and this is also a sequential loop. So there is some problem here with NUMA placement, but uh, these can be fixed. So, and I've, I've intentionally left these slides in because there was this question, I think many C++ people would like to know about this. So here's the, the problem with um, allocation of arrays of objects. Um, we have a class D here. The only purpose of this class for demonstration purposes is to wrap a double. So the only um, data member is a double and there are operators overloaded like operator star that multiply Ds and there's a constructor which works as a, as a type converter. So you can use an object of type D as you would use a double precision scalar. And then you say something like this, D pointer array equals new D of a million. So that will give you a million D objects. They will be initialized using the default constructor, yeah, using zero here and they will be placed into this, array, into this array. This is sequential. You can't just write OMP parallel, um, uh, pragma OMP parallel four in front of this allocation and hope it works. It won't work. It's not a for loop. The for loop is hidden in the C++ runtime. So how do we handle this? Uh, the details about this are in the book. Um, you can overload the operator new for this class D. That's possible. Here's the code for it. And what you do essentially, this is the main part here, is you have to write a loop which traverses the whole memory that's just been allocated. We've done this here using a new car. Car is a byte. And this is a constructor which does not initialize um, the characters in this array. So we get an, a nice virgin array without any physical page mapping. 
And here we have the parallel loop, private j. And we do a, a, a loop from 0 to n minus 1 in jumps of size of d. And inside, uh, d is the data, data type. And inside, we initialize the bytes belonging to each individual object. Why do we have two loops here? Why do I have to write this in this awkward way? Yep. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So I don't know how large D is. It could be large. One object of type D could be a lot of bytes. So I want to initialize in exactly the same way that the data is later used in a loop which uses pointer to D as an iterator, for example. So I want to have a loop for initialization that jumps through the data in, 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 in stride of size of D, just as I do it later in my, in my code. And then, of course, I want to initialize the, the data actually itself. Delete is then trivial. Okay? So you can do this, and this fixes the problem. The only remaining problem is how do you fix the schedule? Because this is in your code. It's your overloaded um, operator. Now, if you need a different schedule for different arrays of type D, you have to exchange the schedule here. So you have to find some ingenious way using a template or using a, a runtime parameter to make it possible to have different schedules here. Okay? Usually you restrict it to static, and the chunk size can be a variable. So that's not, it's not that hard. Okay? Sorry, how did you, how did you get the big chart up to the side of zero? It, it doesn't. It's like a malloc. That's just a malloc? Yeah. You can also use malloc here. No difference. It's a basic data type. Basic data types are not initialized if you, if you use new as a, as a method of allocation. OK, so that's how we fix the array of objects problem. The standard vector problem can also be fixed um, using so-called allocators, because in these um, C++ STL containers, we not only have the data type, the base data type, the value type as an argument, we also have a second optional argument, which is a so-called allocator. And this allocator is a class which has very strict rules. You can read about it in the, in the standard. It's not a fun read. Um, but you can write this class. You can stick to the rules. And what you do is, especially there are some more things you have to do, but the most important thing is the allocate function. And the allocate member function allocates the memory and does the correct placement. Yeah? This is what you have to do. So this can be fixed, at least for the vector container, because that's the only container that guarantees that the data is consecutive in memory. Of course, if you do things like lists or decks or more complex stuff, maps, you're lost. Yeah, this, this, this is not really possible to make this NUMA friendly. Vector is fine. And then you just write vector, and not just double, but in double, and then NUMA allocator of double. And that does the trick. Again, if you want to use different vectors with different schedules, you have to find a way to communicate the schedule into this loop. Not so nice, but possible. OK. How do you diagnose bad locality? How do you know that your code has a NUMA problem? Um, the first indication usually is that if you work on a socket, it's all fine. Probably you scale, probably you have a saturation pattern because you hit the memory bandwidth. If you don't hit a memory bandwidth barrier, the NUMA placement is probably not a problem for you. Okay? This is, of course, only relevant if you have a memory bound situation or almost memory bound. Um, but if you have a NUMA problem, then you scale to the second socket, you see performance doesn't go up or it even goes down. It depends a little bit on the system, what will happen, but it will usually not go up. So that's the first indication that something's wrong. You could still suffer from Amdahl's law, load imbalance, anything else that limits scalability, but it's a first indication. Then the first thing we do when this happens is we try to run with NUMA control dash dash interleave as a wrapper. Because if you have no NUMA placement in your code, so everything is on the first socket, and you run it with NUMA control dash dash interleave, then all the pages will be smeared out, will be interleaved across the system. So you have at least some parallel access. There will be a non-locality, there will be no contention, of course, but it will be better than using it all in the single domain. And if the program then runs faster than in the other, in the standard mode, you know you have a Zuma problem. If it gets slower, the problem is somewhere else. 
Okay, and then finally, and I will come to this in the next talk in a little bit more detail, you can consider using performance counters. Yeah? There are, in modern hardware, there are performance counters and metrics that you can connect to these counters. So you can count a lot of things that are going on on the processor die and on the cores. And for example, with a tool uh, that's contained in the liquid tool suit, liquid perf counter, we can call it with a mem group. Don't worry about the details. It just tells the tool I want to measure memory bandwidth related metrics. And I use it just I would use liquid pin. So I specify a pin mask. This is already also at the same time uh, the cores on which I want to measure this metric, like memory traffic, and I use it as a normal wrapper. And this is what I might get on a strongly NUMA um, limited code for, for an Intel West BEP. This is on a Lima cluster. Um, you get this output with derived metrics. For each core, there's a column. And um, on all processors starting with Intel Nehalem, the memory bandwidth is a metric which is available only once per chip. So whenever you want to measure something that's related to data traffic to main memory, all the counts, all the events that are counted for such an event are only there once per socket, which means if we measure across the cores of our system, the 12 cores, we only get counts for one core per socket. In this case, for core zero and core six. All the other counts, uh, cores have count of zero because we only have one counter per socket. Doesn't make sense. You cannot, you cannot associate a cache line transfer from memory TL3 cache to any specific core. This information is not available on this level. So we only have counts for one core per socket. We have four metrics here. We have the memory bandwidth, which is drawn from main memory for this socket. In this case, 12 gigabytes per second. The same is true for the other socket. We have the remote read bandwidth. So this is 4.2 gigabytes per second. So of these 12 gigabytes per second, 4.2 gigabytes are memory reads that have been initialized, initiated from the other socket. That's already a strong indication that we have a NUMA problem. Yeah? Almost 40% of the memory traffic is from remote reads. Remote writes account for 1.7 gigabytes of, uh, per second. And the sum of these two is the remote bandwidth. So from these 12 gigabytes per second, the half of that, 12, 6 gigabytes per second, are initiated from the other socket. So this is a problem, obviously. Yeah. On the right socket, we have a similar situation, 12 gigabytes bandwidth, and then again, also close to 6 gigabytes per second, initiated from the other socket. So we have a problem here. Um, as you might imagine, I have artificially constructed this example. I have just run the stream benchmark with minus dash, dash, uh, number control dash dash interleave. That's what happens then, okay? Of course, on average, every other access will be remote so that the half of the bandwidth on each socket will be remotely initiated. If you have a real placement problem, so all your data is in socket zero, then all the, all the memory bandwidth will be here. Memory bandwidth here will be almost zero and half of the traffic will be initiated by the other socket. Okay, so that's how you see it with performance counters. Not all processors allow you to see this data. For example, on the Sandy Bridge, there's no counter to measure the remote traffic. At least we haven't found it yet. Uh, there's, a, there's very complicated business. Probably there is one. Okay, um, I think I will skip this for brevity. Okay, here's our last um, visualization of what happens with correct versus incorrect NUMA placement. So we have here a Cray XE6 Interlagos node, four NUMA domains, two sockets, and we run a stream benchmark in three different ways. The green data is the performance across number of domains when the parallel placement is being done correctly. So you see scaling is perfect, performance goes up from 15 or 16 gigabytes per second to 64. That's how it should be in a NUMA system. The red data is for placement in locality domain zero. So everything is in serially, sequentially initialized. All the data is in the first locality domain, and you see there's no speed up. On AMD, we usually see a breakdown when we go to more NUMA domains in this, in this way. And third, in blue, we see the effect of NUMA control dash dash interleave 
um, and we specify the range which is used in the benchmark. So for example, if I run on three NUMA domains, I specify dash dash interleave 0, 1, 2. So I interleave across the domains that I actually use. And you see the penalty on four domains is about 30%. That's actually quite good. This is a machine which has um, a really, really good NUMA behavior. On Cray has done something. So they, they do it better than others. Um, still, it's a notable decrease. Yeah? On other systems, you get a factor of two or more. If you have more NUMA domains, as I mentioned already, the penalties can generally become, become larger. This is an eight NUMA domain system, a four socket um, AMD MagniCore node. Again, with proper placement in green, perfect scaling. With LD1, uh, sorry, LD0 placement, slow down as we go, um, go beyond one NUMA domain. And with interleaved placement, we have this strange behavior. Yeah. So for eight domains, we have a penalty of two to three. This is bad. You don't want to, want to have this, of course. So you see what the NUMA placement can do for you. As I said, it's only relevant if you are memory bandwidth limited, but also if you're not. Many codes which are not bandwidth limited still draw a significant amount of bandwidth. Even if you draw only half the maximum bandwidth, you will feel this NUMA effect. Yeah? It will not be a factor of two in performance, but you will see a notable effect. So it's good to have a good NUMA placement, even though you know you're not quite bandwidth limited. Of course, if you know you're doing divides and exponentials and sine and cosine all the time, and your bandwidth is one megabyte per second, you don't care. Okay? NUMA is not an issue for you. OK. So uh, the last part, sorry, let me finish up. Um, when we deal with CC NUMA, we have first to identify the problem. Is there an issue in your code? The first test is NUMA control dash dash interleave. If it gets faster, you have a NUMA problem. Yeah? And then you can dive in, in it and, and, and try uh, hardware performance counters, for example, to identify the issue more, more exactly. Apply first touch placement. So parallelize loops, which you know are for initialization of data. Uh, although they don't take any time, they are important for the NUMA placement. In C++, the inherent problems can be fixed sometimes. Of course, you're stuck with uh, static scheduling. If you use dynamic scheduling, you could still use NUMA control dash dash interleave or interleave the arrays by hand. That's possible using API calls there in the slides. Um, and I have skipped the issue of buffer cache. Let me tell you this just briefly. Buffer cache is an uh, automatic cache memory that's being, um, that's being kept by the Linux kernel. Also, other operating systems do this. Whenever you write something to disk, the Linux kernel keeps some pages or all of the pages in memory. So if you read it back, you read it from memory. This is a good idea, of course. Yeah? In server environments, you want to have a huge buffer cache so you don't have to go to disk all the time. For high performance computing, this is bad because Linux values the buffer cache very highly. And if there's one locality domain full of buffer cache, it will give you memory on the other domain. No problem, because memory is there, it's just somewhere else. The kernel doesn't care that you have a NUMA problem. Okay? So this may, made, uh, um, may impact proper placement, and there are ways to fix it. And if you want to know more about this, we can talk about this in the break. OK. The last part is about simultaneous multithreading, but we will skip this in favor of the more interesting stuff that we're going to do. Uh, I think these slides should be online already. Good. So as an interlude, and I will also have a demo for this, um, I would like to point out some peculiarities when using hardware performance metrics. Um, I've already gave you a, a glance on it, what, what we can do with it. For example, with the um, NUMA traffic measurements on, on systems where you can identify NUMA problems with hardware performance counters. Performance counters are very popular. So um, we often have students in our seminars and when they write code and they have a working version and then we ask them, okay, you have a working version, what do you do next? And then they say, I'd like to measure the cache misses. Why? There's not really a reason for measuring cache misses unless you know that cache misses are a problem. And if you know that cache misses are a problem, you understand your code, you can predict the cache misses. So why measure them in the first place? So that's not the way we try to look um, into performance counters. We use performance counters in different ways, and I will try to motivate this in these 
in this short talk. Okay, so hardware performance metrics are ubiquitous. You see them everywhere. They're even automatic analysis tools that try to measure what's going on in your code on the specific hardware and give you automatic advice. Yeah, Intel Retune or Amplify, as it's today called, has this automatic um, tuning advice and it tells you this is your hotspot and there are lots of cache misses. Do something about it. Well, thank you. Um, they're supported by many tools. And as I said, cache misses are viewed as the, the, most, the worst possible thing in computing. So often, hardware perform performance counter measurements are reduced to cache misses. But there's much more to that, as you will see. We like to think about, and now you, you know this now, uh, about computing in terms of bottlenecks. How well are certain bottlenecks utilized? And if I can use hardware performance counters to identify the bottleneck and whether it's utilized to its full extent, this is a good thing. So I, I use it to, to uh, corroborate my, my suspicion that a certain bottleneck applies. And there are typical performance patterns uh, that can be identified using hyper hardware performance counter signatures. And that's how we, how we work usually with these metrics. How do we get hold of these performance metrics? Now, each processor today has hardware performance counters. Usually, the number of counters that you can use is quite limited. For example, between two and eight, or something like that. The number of metrics, the number of events that you can measure on the processor chip is in the hundreds. So on modern Intel processors, you have about 500 different performance metrics, events that you count, that you are potentially able to count. Probably 95% of those you don't even understand. We don't either. So probably the only for the uh, processor architects, but some of those are really useful. And there are lots of tools, as I said, but we use liquid perf counter in many cases. It's a part of the liquid tool suit to measure the most important stuff. So liquid perf counter is um, motivated by perfex. Does anybody know perfex? SGI origin, 1998. Okay, this was, this was the first tool I know that used this. There must be earlier references. On AIX, it's called HPM count. On Altic systems, it's called LibFPM. So it's an, um, these tools are, in the first place, end-to-end -end measurement tools. So you can start your binary. At the same time, you start the measurement. You measure some metrics, like cache misses or flops or whatever. And at the end, you get a number. So many flops were done. So many cache misses occurred. Okay, that's the motivation for using liquid perf counter. Um, the bad thing about performance counters on modern x86 systems is that these metrics that you want to measure are highly volatile. If you go to the next processor generation, and this already happens between Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, you get completely different names, different metrics. Some metrics drop out, others come in. So these, these things fluctuate, and they're really badly documented. So what we try to do and we keep on kicking Intel to give us this, this documentation, but sometimes they're just a little bit uh, behind. Um, we, what we try to maintain is a list of useful counters and try to give you an abstraction layer that give you the right things that you want to see. Of course, it's not ours to decide what you want to see, but there are some things everybody wants to see from time to time. So for example, if you call liquid perf counter minus A on a modern processor, this could be a Sandy Bridge, you get this list. And you see there are different um, names here, branch, measures branch prediction ratios, cache, cache miss ratios. You can measure the clock speed. Quite interesting because we have turbo mode. Processor speeds can change. So clock gives you uh, something about the clock speed. Data is loads and stores, flops in double precision and sequ in single precision variants, x87 flops if you have them, um, L2 and L3 cache accesses and misses, memory transfer bandwidths, and TLB misses. These are the things you usually want to look at. There are others. If you have special needs, you can always access the bare counters. If you're used to Pappy, who, are, who has ever used Pappy? So if the, those guys who use Pappy, you know that these two interfaces, a low level and a high level interface, you can still access all the metrics directly. It's like the Pappy low level interface. And these performance groups are the high level interface of liquid perf counter. So behind the group, such as L2, there are metrics which measure, for example, in this case, how many cache lines travel between L1 and L2. They have awkward names that you don't want to know about, and we try to maintain this, this group for every modern architecture to give you a correct measurement for this kind of metric. This is the benefit of using this tool. 
So here's a simple example. We have a stream benchmark. We run liquid perf counter and with a metric or with a group called flops dp. You specify it with minus g, flops dp. We run it with four threads. It runs, uh, it, it's liquid perf counter can be used as a combination of pinning and perf counting. So if you use minus big C here, it means measure on those cores. So measure the core 0, 1, 2, 3. And at the same time, do the pinning on these cores. If I had used a small lowercase c, it would just measure on 0 to 3, but would not do any pinning. If I don't want any pinning, I don't have to. OK. Um, this is very important to realize. Liquid perf counter takes the cores on which it should measure the metrics from this list. Whether or not you're running something on there is entirely your business. Okay? If somebody else runs code on, this co on these cores, you will measure somebody else's code. So the only association of the measurement and the code is the pinning. You have to take care that the cores on which you want to do the measurement are the cores on which you run your program. So this is an Intel Core Little Field. It's an, uh, I think it's a Westmere type processor, quite old already. The, measure, the group is flops dp, and you always get in this mode two blocks of output. You see we're doing a wrapper. This is a wrapper mode, so complete end-to-end -end measurement. All the counts that you get are from, end, from start to end. It starts running as soon as the binary starts. The first box is the raw measurements, the raw metrics. And you see these two blue metrics here, instructions retired any, and CPU clock unholded core. These are metrics which are always measured. They are hardwired counters that always measure how many instructions you execute and how many clock cycles pass without the CPU sleeping. And these are the those two. You, go, you always get them because they're always sort of important. Okay? Because clock unhalted gives you the time, the heartbeat, and instructions is, is generally useful. And you see here, these cores execute an instruction count of about 20, uh, 200 million instructions. A little bit less on the core zero, a little more on the others. On the second, uh, sorry, the, the black box here, the black uh, block, these are the actual floating point events. So for example, <clears throat> we see here floating point computation operations executed with SSE in scalar mode and in packed mode, so vectorized mode. So we see this code is almost perfectly vectorized. All the counts, all the events are in packed. And we also see this code is double precision only because the count for single precision operations is zero. This is a perfectly vectorized double precision code. It's stream, yeah, stream is perfectly vectorized double precision. Okay, the second box contains some derived metrics. Derived metrics are things that are computed from the raw counts and which are probably interesting. Yeah? For example, the CPI. CPI is a metric that counts how, or that, that tells you how many cycles it takes to execute one instructions on average. Now the minimum CPI, the best possible CPI you can get on a modern CPU is, one, is 0.25, one quarter, because modern CPUs can execute at most, one, uh, at most four instructions per cycle. So the CPI is at 0.25, it means that the instruction throughput resource on your CPU is fully utilized. If your code is good or bad, you don't know. Yeah? It could be a really bad code. So it turns out that really bad codes have a good CPI, ironically. For example, if you, if you execute numeric code that's written in Perl, yeah, then you get a good CPI. Because of course, on the low level, on the assembly level, this Perl program executes stuff you don't want to know about, but it's not your numerics. So CPI is cycles per instruction. In this case, it's quite high. So we're only executing one instructions every four cycles. That's really bad. It's only 1 16th of the capability of the processor, but that's not surprising because this is stream. We're waiting for memory all the time. OK, so that's fine. Here we have megaflops, packed and scalar microops, and a couple of other things. So that's not too important here. And of course, these metrics change if you go to another processor architecture because the events are named differently. Probably they are gone and others kick in for them. So we try to maintain something that's useful for everybody. Now, once you have such a tool, you want to know how to use it. 
And here we've put together on one slide a typical way how we think one should use such, such a tool and such metrics. So on the left column, we see the things to look at, roughly in this order. And as you know, we're, we're trying to think about execution in terms of bottlenecks. So the most important thing should be fixed first, and then we think about bottlenecks. So the most important thing is like load balance. First, fix the load balance. It doesn't make sense to think about uh, bottlenecks before you have fixed the load balance issue. And that's quite easy to identify with liquid perf counter because you can measure what's going on in every core. And if one core has less work, you will see it. You have an example on the next slide. Um, then next, in socket bandwidth saturation. If you see that your code draws 40 gigabytes per second out of the memory on a modern Sandy Bridge, then you have a limit, you have a limit in the memory bandwidth, or you're very close to it at least. Yeah. Then there could be a bandwidth saturation on the shared cache, on the Westmere, for example, where the cache is a uh, bandwidth limiting resource. <clears throat> then you could measure flops per second. That's something, if you're already at the stage where you do performance modeling, you probably don't need. Yeah, because you know that you're looking at a specific loop, you know exactly how many flops are in this loop, so you know how many flops per second are done by a time measurement. But if you don't quite know, you can just get a, an image of what's going on. You will see later that liquid perf counter can also be used to listen to a core and see what's going on. We use this very frequently. If a new customer comes to our clusters, they use thousands of CPU hours. We just log into the nodes and see what's going on. Very instructive sometimes. So flops, loads, and stores per flop. So you can actually measure the code balance using the perf counter. Just measure the flops and the loads and stores. You can do the quotient to get the code balance. Simni vectorization, of course, I've shown this in the previous example, the CPI metric, and also the number of instructions. And then things like branches, mispredictions, and so on, which are often not so important in scientific computing, but which may become important in special cases. What are things to look out for? Load imbalance, if you want to measure load imbalance, you can do that. But the number of instructions, if you think that the number of executed instructions is a good indication of load balance, then you might be wrong. I will show you an example. Um, <clears throat> if you have a performance saturation in the socket, that might be a bandwidth saturation. You might hit a bottleneck. But it might have other reasons, like Amdahl's law, for example. So you have to take care. And cache misses are overrated. You, know, you see here? There's no cache miss. <laughs> yeah? So we usually don't measure cache misses. Because in our way of thinking about the architecture, hardware prefetches take care of getting in and getting out cache lines. So it's all streaming. And in most cases, that's true. So the cache misses are not an important metric. It's more, much more important how many cache lines per second I'm getting in and out. And that I can measure. OK. Now let's identify load imbalance with liquid perf counter. We have this artificial example where we have this parallel loop. It's actually a matrix vector multiply, but it's only half a matrix because we do an I loop from 1 to N, and the J loop, the inner loop, goes from 1 to I. So this is triangular matrix times vector. And of course, if you do it like this with static scheduling, this is severely load imbalanced because the thread that gets the highest the upper chunk from the matrix has uh, only very few um, rows. And the thread which gets the last chunk has the, la has the largest amount of work. So we have an artificial load imbalance here imposed on this execution. OK. Now you can think about what, what, I, what should I measure? What should I look at? I measure floating point instructions here, clock cycles and instructions on these cores. So six cores here on one socket of the Westmere processor. And you see, actually, I um, expect that core 0 will have the least amount of work, and core 5 should have the highest amount of work. If I use instructions as a work metric, that's a surprise here. We see core 0 executes 21 billion instructions, core 1 executes less, core 2 even less. Then we have a minimum at core 3, which executes 1. Uh, 16 billion instructions, and then core 4 and core 5 go up again. So we have a lot of work in core 0, less in the middle, and then more at the end. Really strange behavior. So it's not at all what we expect from a clearly load and balance situation where we exactly know that core 0 should have the least amount of work, least amount of uh, useful work. And also CPI. CPI is generally not bad 
for a code which should be um, memory bound. It's between point 0.86 and 1.13, but there's also no real pattern. It goes up here and goes down again back here. Also, really strange picture. The point here is what we're measuring if we measure instructions retired is not the actual work that we do. We do measure the work, the flops. That's the, the real work that we're interested in. But we also, also measure all the stuff that happens if a thread finishes early, such as core zero, and ends up waiting in the barrier. Waiting in a barrier, at least for some time, means that the core executes instructions that spin on some variable. It's waiting. It's waiting in a barrier. That means spinning, at least for some timeout time. So instructions retired is not a good metric. When a core spins on a, on a variable waiting for it to increase or decrease, it executes a lot of instructions. See that here? In, in a sense, it's very efficient. It utilizes the CPU, so the CPI value is low, but it doesn't do useful work. Most of the work is not floating point. So what we have to look at is the actual useful work. And this is, in this case, floating point instructions or operations. Here we see fpcom operations executed SSE double precision. And here we see what we want to see. So we have um, about 500 million floating point operations here. 1 billion here, 1.6 billion, 2.2, 2.6, 3.0. So this is the behavior we expect. The useful work is flops here in this, in this case. Instructions retired is not the correct metric to look at. Of course, if you have a loop that handles integers, that might be a problem. You have to find another metric that quantifies better what you want to see. Here's a similar example, but here we have a complete matrix vector multiply. No load imbalance visible. And you see the CPI is almost constant across the course. It's worse than before, because now we're actually doing work. And for each multiply add that we do, we have to uh, load at least A from main memory. So this is really memory bound across all cores, and we have a higher CPI, worse CPI, but better code. It's faster. Yeah? So we have um, about 850, 800 megaflops per core, where we only have between 800 and about 100 per core in the load imbalance situation. So this is a code that utilizes CPU in a, in a worse way. CPI is higher, but has higher performance because it's load balanced. OK, so I think I have motivated why instructions retired might not be a good metric. And the same applies to MPI. If you wait an MPI on some data to be received from another node, usually the MPI implementation spin, at least for some time. You can configure this mostly, so you can say, please spin for five milliseconds and then go to sleep. But usually they spin for some time. And this spinning incurs a lot of instructions also burns a lot of power. Good, so, so far we have executed liquid perf counter in, in wrapper mode. So we started our application um, using liquid perf counter as a wrapper. And when the application ended, liquid perf counter ended and gave us the counts. You can also use it in what we call stethoscope mode. This is shown here. So you specify, as usual, the cores on which you want to measure. In this case, all 12 cores of our node. You specify the, the uh, performance group and minus S10 in this case without any binary. Minus S10 says just sleep for 10 seconds and listen. You could just as well say sleep 10. has the same effect. Okay, so this, this command line listens for 10 seconds what happens on core 0 to 11. And this is, is essentially what we do to monitor the flop rate on our clusters. Yeah. We run this every couple of minutes for half a minute and you make a pretty graph, and we can show the flop rate on the clusters. So it's a, essentially a monitoring tool, but also very useful if you want to say, see what people are doing on your precious hardware. So here's, for example, graphs that you can draw. Liquid Perf Counter does not do the graphs for you. It will only give you uh, a line of output. Uh, sorry, sorry, I have to one step back. Uh, there's another mode, timeline mode. It's a little bit like stethoscope but you get a measurement every so and so many milliseconds. So you say, again, metric, course, and then minus D, and then a time interval. And in this case, it will measure every 50 milliseconds on all the cores you specified. You can pipe the output to a text file. It's a one line per measurement, and you can easily grab it and put it into your favorite graphical 
uh, tool. So these are graphics from this tool. For example, we see here the single position gigaflops for four different code versions versus runtime. And on the right hand side, we see the memory bandwidth in gigabytes per second versus runtime for those four versions. And you can even zoom in. Probably the, the shortest time interval you should use here is of the order of 10, 5 to 10 milliseconds. There is some overhead con connected to that. So if you go below, below a couple of milliseconds, then you will have distorted measurements. You shouldn't do that. As I said, you have to do the graphics yourself. It's not, um, not contained. Um, there is a tool, I think it should be also contained in the, in the distribution, which is called Liquid Perf Scope, that gives you an oscilloscope-like um, image. So it uses GNUplot to visualize the data. If you really can, can make use of that, you can try. OK. Now, up to now, we haven't specified that only certain parts of the code should be measured. Uh, either we use it as a wrapper to use end-to-end -end measurements, or we use it in wrapper in, in, in stethoscope mode or timeline mode to listen what's going on on the, on the course. You can also use a simple, we call it marker API, to single out certain regions in your code. So if you know that your initialization phase is quite large and you only want to measure this, this simple loop that only takes 5% of the time, you can do this. You have to initialize the marker API. You can start a region. You can give it a name. You can even have multiple regions. Starting and stopping is done using the API. And at the end, you have to use liquid marker close. Then it will write uh, the data out to disk. And then the post-processing will kick in and, and give you the output. What you get then is an output that looks like the standard liquid perf counter output. But you get one block per region. So in this case, you get a block that's called compute, and you get a block that's called post-process. And it will only contain the measurements within that region. So you, in this case, this way you can measure a certain loop that you're interested in. Now, if you have a stencil code, you have some pre-processing, post-processing, and the stencil update, you can put liquid marker start region and stop region around the stencil update loop and measure exactly what's going on in this part of the loop. I'll have a demo uh, later. And finally, <coughs> there are group files. You can even, if you know how to do it better, if you find some metrics interesting and you want to make that available to Liquid, you can do that. You can write your own group files, which you can then use with minus G on the command line. So if you have found a certain metric that's attractive and applicable to your problem, you can write your own group file. You can put that into a directory, recompile Liquid Perf Counter, and then have your own group. In this case, it's called PSTI. So this is documented on the, on the website. I will not go into details here. OK, demo. OK, so I want to demo the liquid perf counter tool for stream benchmark. That's, that's complicated enough. Um, what I first want to do is show you how it's used. So liquid perf counter minus A. This is on our ME cluster, which has Ivy Bridge processors, 10 cores. And liquid perf counter minus A gives you a list of all available performance groups. So on this particular processor, this is what we support. So this branch, branch metrics, data, energy. Quite interesting, how, much, how many joules do you burn in your code? Um, Flops with AVX, double scan precision, um, L2, L3 caches, memory, MemDP and MemSP are combined groups that measure flops, memory traffic, and energy. So that's probably the things you want to do first, uh, and TLB. So that's what we support right now. Of course, as I said, there are over 500 metrics on this processor, but these are the, the interesting ones. OK, now let's just run the stream benchmark. We run it on cores 0 to 2, for example. The stream OMP in ONT.exe. So I've compiled a stream benchmark um, with no non temporal stores, standard stores. Uh, it only uses SSE vectorization. You don't see this here. And I still need to specify the group minus G. And out of the groups that I have at my disposal, I use flops DP, for instance. Double precision flops. I want to just see double precision flops. Uh, 
Okay, it's gone very quickly. Okay, so you see, although I have used the pinning feature, I've used this uppercase C, so it does the pinning. There's no diagnostic output from the pinning. So if you use liquid perf counter for pinning, there's no diagnostic output. Um, to not clutter it too much. Um, this is just the standard output from the, from the stream benchmark. We have three threads yeah, because our mask was zero to two. It's running with three threads. We're getting the output from the benchmark itself. So copy uses about 25 gigabytes per second. Scale also 25 and add and try it a little bit faster. And here at the end, this would be the end of the benchmark. Usually it would get the prompt, but now liquid perf counter gives me the output. And we have this box with the raw events. Since you measure on three cores, core one two, zero, one, two, we get three columns here. Instructions retired is the number of instructions. CPU clock unhalted core, CPU clock unhalted ref. You see the CPU clock unhalted core is about 1.8 billion. So while the code was running, it it, it, the processor executed 1.8 billion clock cycles. That's how long it took to execute the code. Um, this relates to real clock cycles. So if this processor runs at three gigahertz, it has three giga clock cycles per second. Now if the processor frequency changes, and you know today it can change any time, depending on temperature, utilization, whatever, um, you don't get a correct time measurement. You know, if your clock speed certainly goes down, then the, the clock length is larger. And if you base your time measurement on this, you get wrong timings. That's why we have always the second counter, clock cycle, CPU clock unhalted ref. And this reference counter always runs with the CPU's base clock frequency. In this case, this is 2.2 gigahertz. So if, any, if you do anything with time measurement based on clock cycles, clock unhalted ref is your friend. This is the only reliable clock source. Unhalted core is not reliable because it can fluctuate. Okay, we see here that in this case, we have floating point code, which is packed, almost non, almost no scalar instructions. Okay. Um, you see that we're executing in core two, for example, about seven times 10 to the eight instructions, and about 2.3 times 10 to the eight of those are actually floating point. So about one third of all instructions are floating point. Now that's not really relevant because we're measuring end to end here. Yeah? This is from start to end. And the stream benchmark consists of allocating data, initializing it, doing these four benchmarks in turn many times. So this is a, a convolution of different things. So the actual um, counts doesn't really, it's not really interesting here. Okay, uh, then you have a second box which hasn't been shown in the slides. It's a statistics box. So for these events, we have also statistics, so how many events summed over all cores or to the maximum minimum. So you can here see a load imbalance in the instructions retired and also the load imbalance in the actual work. And in the end, we have the derived metrics. Runtime, 2.55 seconds. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, here is the derived metrics. Runtime unhalted, 0.82 seconds. Runtime RDTSC, 0.85 seconds. And that's the real runtime. The runtime unhalted here, this is the runtime as calculated with the actual clock, which was higher than 2.2 gigahertz. What was the clock? It tells us here, 2.8 gigahertz. So this 2.2 gigahertz processor switched to turbo mode and ran at 2.8 gigahertz. Now if I only execute with a single thread, It runs at three gigahertz. Yeah. This is the blessing of turbo mode. And there's actually a tool which is not contained yet in the official distribution. It will be next time, uh, next, next major version. Liquid set frequencies, which can print and also set the frequencies. You see here, it gives us for every CPU, the frequency that's set, it's 2.201 gigahertz. The 01 is decisive because it tells us turbo mode is enabled. If I set the frequency, I can do that. For example, to 2.0 gigahertz. Oops, not available. 2.2, okay, that's the base frequency of the processor. I do the test again. One thread, 
So if we had turbo mode, it will clock up to 3 gigahertz, but now we have standard frequency uh, enforced. Clock speed is 2.2 gigahertz. And you see also that the uh, clock cycles on hold at core and clock cycles on hold at ref are equal now. Same number of cycles. Sorry? You need, um, yes, yes, we have, what we, what I did was I used liquid set frequencies. This is a script and it calls a little binary, which is SUID root, which does the actual setting. Yeah. But you always need something that's SUID root f also for measuring the counters. Okay, <clears throat> so you can play around with the frequencies. We leave it at that. Okay, this was end-to-end -end measurement. How do we restrict the measurement to certain parts of the code? And I've prepared this. I will put this um, on the website so you can download it for reference. So what you first need is the liquid header, liquid.h. So you always need that if you want to use some kind of some of this API functionality. And the first thing you need to do in your code in order to use liquid markers is liquid marker init. This is actually a macro that's defined in the header. Um, if you define a certain symbol when compiling, these macros have a meaning. If you don't define the symbol, there are no ops. So you can switch on and switch off the markers as you like. Okay, so liquid marker init initializes the whole liquid thing. Then as we want to measure each and every thread in a parallel region, there's another thing we need to do. Oops. Messed up. So in the first parallel region we open up, this is actually for the benchmark to output the number of threads we have liquid marker thread in it. So if you want to benchmark a threaded code, you have to call liquid marker in it and liquid marker thread in it in the first parallel region. Okay. Then the next thing is liquid marker start. So here we have the copy loop. This is the code for the stream copy benchmark. C of J equals A of J. And actually, we don't really need the if def liquid perf mon. It's, 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 um, not necessary here. You could just write liquid marker start. I give this region the name copy, and after measuring, I say liquid marker stop copy. This is all inside the parallel region. So every thread that you want to measure must call this liquid marker start and liquid marker stop. The parallel region opens here. Okay. So I open the parallel region. I call liquid marker start, do the actual benchmark in parallel, and call liquid marker stop. And then this region copy will only measure events that are related to this piece of code. So I monitor the copy loop, and further down, I monitor the add loop. This is stream add, C of J, A of J plus B of J. The same pattern applies, so I'm liquid marker start add, liquid marker stop add. And at the end of the program, I need to call liquid marker close. There's no need to call liquid marker thread close. There's no such function. So it's sufficient to call liquid marker close. Okay. Ooh. Okay, that's how I compile this example. Um, I use the Intel compiler. I use the normal options that I use to compile the stream benchmark. Not so important here. I don't use non-temporal stores. Uh, what's important is um, this is messed up. This is correct. Okay, so I use minus D liquid perfmon. This activates all the macros. If I don't activate liquid perfmon, it will not do anything. It will not compile the macros. Minus I dollar liquid ink dear. This is a, a variable that comes from the module. So I, I tell the compiler where to find the header. Minus L dollar liquid dip dear. That tell, tells the compiler where to find the liquid library to link in. I have to link in the library minus L liquid and I compile my code. Sorry, I don't know why this L liquid is twice in there. Doesn't matter. Okay, it compiles. And then I can do the liquid perf counter again. Let's do it with one thread first, same metric. And as you see, I'm configuring the metric I want to use on the command line. It's not in the API, so I don't have to put into my code what I want to measure. I configure this completely from the command line. 
The API is only for switching it on and off. Okay, I execute it here. Um, of course, I don't want to do the Steam OMP. I want to do a.out. Dot okay, and I only measure on core zero, flops dp. Hmm. So I get the output from the benchmark. I get some output from Liquid, but, but, but it doesn't really look like it's doing something useful. The reason is, if I want to use the markers that are in the code now, I have to specify minus m. So you still can do end-to-end -end measurements, even with markers compiled in, if you use liquid perf counter as usual. It will ignore the marker data. Only if you use minus m as a command line switch will it recognize the, the markers. Okay. Okay, now we see, after the benchmark is finished, we get two regions, region copy, and this data is exclusive for the copy region. It tells us the region info, how, many, how often it was called, how often the markers were um, called, and what the runtime was. So it spent 0.33 seconds in this region executing code. Counts for this region What do we see? No floating point instructions. So it measures SSE and AVX instructions. None there. Why? Because copy doesn't do any work. It only loads data and stores data. No flops being done. So there's no count for the flops. However, in the add region, we do flops. And it's AVX, obviously. So SIMD FP256, these are AVX flops. They're all packed. And we're doing 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 7, about Close to about one third of all instructions are SIMD floating point instructions in this region. Yeah. And that's plausible because I'm doing one load for one of the arrays, one load for the other, a store for C and an add, and a couple of integer stuff. So this is roughly the ratio we expect. Okay, now we can run with th three threads. And you see, I get the same output, except that I get a column for every core I have measured. I could do the same things, but restricted to these regions. So the, the, probably the most useful thing to start with is the memdp or memsp um, group, because this measures as much as you can measure in a single run. It's not possible to measure 100 metrics at the same time, because there's just a, a small set of counters that you can use at the same time. But memdp combines floating point um, throughput, um, energy measurements, and memory bandwidth. These can be measured at the same time. OK, so here we see, uh, I, I don't care about scrolling up. Here we see the derived metrics. Uh, runtime was 0.58 seconds for the add region, clock speed. Of course, this doesn't make sense to sum across the cores for the, for the clock speed, so this is not a, a, a useful metric. Yeah. Energy, six joules. OK, if it's important to you, that's fine. Um, the process of power was 31 watts. The DRAM power was 36 watts. That comes out of the Intel REPL interface. They have built in an interface in the Sandy Bridge processor that gives you this information. Total power, 67 watts for, for executing the ad. There's some inaccuracy here. Yeah? So you could only get a power reading every millisecond. So, yeah? There's a counter in the hardware. Intel provides this starting with the Sandy Bridge processor. It's called, as the, whole, the whole subsystem is called RAPL, Running Average Power Limit, RAPL. And we use the power measurement function that's built into that. Um, we have 1.4 gigaflops here. Uh, complete AVX performance. It's almost exclusively AVX. A tiny fraction is SSE code. And here we have the bandwidth. The bandwidth drawn by these cores is 33 gigabytes per second for this particular code with this number of threads. We're only using three threads, so we can't use the complete memory bandwidth, which would be like 40 gigabytes per second. So 
And now I want to show you what happens if you don't do pinning. So minus small c means measure on these cores, but don't do any pinning. Okay? I can just leave the pinning to any, somebody else. And this will mean I get an output for each of those cores, but I'm not sure whether my code is actually running on these three cores. That is surprising. Okay, that's because of the markers. Okay, it, it doesn't really work without uh, with the markers. That's right. So let me check without markers. Yeah. So you see, um, for the add, I see some mega flops, but it's not really what I expect. Yeah? The mega flop number is much too low. So obviously, for some time, some part of this code ran on these cores, but the rest of the time, the the cores were busy somewhere else. It's not what I expect here. So I only get 347 megaflops instead of the over one gigaflop I had before. Because you have to take care that the pinning is done correctly. So if you use OpenMP pinning, use the minus big C switch. OK. I think that was what I wanted to show. I think it's already time for the for the break. Okay, and we have the break uh, until three o'clock.